Bible says in Ecclesiastes, for they accomplish more than being alone. That's why we have to work as a team. You will become an excellent and effective leader when you begin to realize that leadership is not an option. You have to know the career of your calling. I love you, but I ain't come to celebrate you. I can't celebrate you. Now, when you have a birthday party or anniversary, something like that, we, we keep your car and come down, whatever, but, right? And chapter 33. Now I make reference to this a few times, but I never got into it. I, I won't. I probably won't uh, this morning, but at least get it started. Now this is. Everybody know who Moses is. <clears throat> and here's Moses is asking for God's presence. Now remember, God called him to lead his people into a place called the promise of God, a land that flows with milk and honey. Now, this, there's some interesting parts of this that, man, I, I, I'm, I'm going to ask the Lord to help me not go all the way with this, but at least to get you started, to get us started. So let's begin in verse 12, and then you'll get the context of, of this, this passage. Verse 12, it says, Then Moses said to the Lord, he said, see, you say to me, bring up this people. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. <clears throat> Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. The Lord said that to him. He, says, he said, okay. He says, but I don't know who, who's going to be with me. And then verse 13 says, now therefore... I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that the, this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Verse 15, then he said to him, it's Moses now talking to God. He says, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us, so we shall be separate your people and I from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. But are you getting this? He said, that's how we know. Oh, well, look up here. Look up here for a moment. This is how everybody would know that we are your people. If your presence go with us. If, it, if your presence don't go with us, how would they know that we are your people? How would the world know? In other words, if you're gathered, if there's a group of people gathering like it is to this, this morning, without the presence of God, this would be a club. Come on, church. This will just be a gathering. <coughs> this will be like a, a, a clubhouse. But when the presence of God comes in, now it becomes the people of God and it becomes the church of the living God. Right? He said, how would they know? How would we know? How, how would they know that we are your people, separate people, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth? In other words, they ought to recognize that something different. The Bible says we are peculiar people. That don't mean you're strange. We're holy priesthood of peculiar people. That don't mean you need to be strange or look strange and act strange. Come on. It's automatic because of what you carry, because of what's, uh, who's in us. <coughs> Verse 17. 
So the Lord said to Moses, look, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, please show me your glory. This is good now. He says, I know. You're, you're, God says, okay, I'll go with you. He said, I'll go with you. You've found grace in my sight. And then he, he, Moses said, look, Lord, just show me your glory. And then verse 19, then he says, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. Mm. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see my face or see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. Let me stop there for a moment. Show me your glory. Now, just now, he said, I let my goodness pass before you. What God is saying, if you continue to read, which we will in a minute, in a moment, my goodness will pass before you. He's responding to the request of his glory, to show his glory. The glory of the Lord to the body of, the, of Christ is his goodness towards us. Hello? Remember, it is God's goodness that leads people to repentance. Hello? So he said, look, uh, he said, I'll let my goodness pass before you. But you can't see my face, but I let my goodness pass before you. And, and then he says, and the Lord says, Here's a place by me, that's verse 21, and you shall stand on the rock. Mm. Now, there's something I want to show you here. Oh, this is, I, this, this, I get started with this, it's hard to stop, all right? Because if you go back to verse 19, let's just go back just for a moment. He said, watch this. All of my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. The name of the Lord before you. If you keep reading, God says to Moses at one, one place, he said, look, he said, I have revealed myself as God Almighty to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I have not told them that I am the Lord. And I'm revealing myself to you as the Lord. Everybody say the Lord. Lord. You know what Lord means, right? Okay. He said, I'm going to reveal myself to you. I haven't revealed myself to them except through um, God Almighty. But to you, the Lord. I'll proclaim the name of the Lord. So when you study it, in Hebrew, the original name of the Lord was never, ever to be spoken. Because God's name was so revered that it was not proper to even speak his word, his name, as it were. When the Jewish, when, when the priests and, and those who take the scroll and write the scriptures, once they get to the name of God, they had to go wash themselves. Even wash the, the, the pen that they use for the sake of, and wash themselves every time they get to the name of God because they should not utter it. It was so much to be revered and respected that they couldn't speak his word. So the, the, so the word of God, the name of God, which we pronounce today as Yahweh, and some say Jehovah, same thing, it's supposed to be. Is everybody still with me? 
Y-H-W-H. Get a picture of that name. Get a picture of that name in your mind. Y-H-W-H. How do you pronounce that? Hmm. How do you pronounce Y-H-W-H? You can't. So when we translated the YHWH, we add the, the A. Y A. So so we call Yahweh. You still with me? Now I know I'm taking my time because I want to be deliberate in you hearing what I'm saying. I learned some things recently, and I'm I'm saying this for a reason, okay? So don't, don't get bored with me. Just listen for a moment. This will turn out all right. <clears throat> when, when, when the name of God was translated into English, the other letters was added to it so that we'll know how to pronounce it. Because it was never meant to be spoken with your tongue. He was so holy that you're not supposed to speak his name. Still with me? Now, this is important. It's, it's important to know because of the power of God and the holiness of God. And the fact that that's why when somebody called me, someone say, Reverend, I don't like to hear the term Reverend. Because that's only, that's exclusively for God himself. It's only he should be revered. Still with me? You know in, what we learn in school, A-E-I-O-U. What are those? Huh? See, in that day, there was no vowels. And so we added the vowels to it, that's why we say Yahweh. But the truth is, the way to pronounce the YH, those letters, is in the breath of the individual. Have you heard that before? Okay. And this is something I never knew. It's supposed to be the breath. It means the breath. It's like when God breathed into Adam's uh, nostrils. He breathed the breath of God, the life of God. And that's how we... That's how we're born. Because the first thing happened when you, when you come out of the womb, you breathe. And really, you're acknowledging God. Right? So that was the first thing that I caught on to when he says, I'll tell you, I'll, I'm going to tell you what my name is. You remember, God said to Moses prior to this, when Moses asked the question, who do I tell them sent me? And all the Lord said, he didn't give him his name. He just tell him, I am. Just say, I am. See? Just tell him, I am, sent you. So the mo see, we were created in his image, right? And in his like, I'm going somewhere. Hold on, hold on. We we're created in his image and in his likeness. Everything is created after its kind. And we were created after God kind. And that's why he breathed into man. And the life comes from God. Doesn't come from AI. Doesn't come from the lab. Didn't come from your mother, your father. It came from God. And the first breath you breathe when you were born in this world, you're acknowledging God. So someone said, they said it this way. When you breathe, you're acknowledging God because your breath comes from God. Right? And they say, and they say this is how you say his name. <gasps> That's Yahweh. <gasps> That's God. You say it when you're born and you say it the day you die. That's the last thing you say before you die. Now, I just learned this. I didn't know this. 
And I thought it was very unique and very interesting. So the life that you have comes from God. Even before you were born again. But when you become born again, you got a new life, which is called eternal life, called Zoe. That's the complete life of God. Amen. Now, I needed to acknowledge that because it, it needs to put some faith on the inside of you that God is still concerned about you no matter where you are. No matter if you're a Christian or a non-Christian, the Bible said he caused it to reign upon the just as well as the unjust. So whether we, you, you acknowledge him or not, you acknowledge him. Just the fact that you can breathe. Just the fact that you're able to breathe. And God set it up that way. But then, then that's just an a, a offshoot here for a moment. And then it says, and this, I would go back down to verse 22. So it shall be while my glory pass that I will put you in the cliff on the rock. And I will cover you with my hand. You go back to verse 20. But he says, you cannot see my face, for no man see my face and live. He says, but there's a place by me, right? The, 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 the NLT says, there's a place near me. If you want to see my, hello, look, look at, if you want to see my glory, there's a place near me. And I'll put you on the rock. He's talking about Jesus already. He's already, he's already given hints. I'll put you on the rock. <clears throat> and then I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. In other words, I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock. Our life is hid with Christ in God. You're still with me, right? My life is hid with Christ in God. And God is already showing Moses what he's about to do. And then I'll put my hand when I pass by, because you can't see my glory yet. And then the moment I pass by, I'll remove my hand and you will see my hind part. In other words, you'll see the afterglow of my glory. But you can't see the full impact of it. This will never happen and live. Hello? Verse 23, I will take my hand, I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not, that shall not, uh, but my face shall not be seen. This is some powerful stuff here. But you know, notice this happened way back when. Now we can look in the face of God. Not like Moses did, but because of who we are now in Christ. I'll, I'll put you where? On the rock. <laughs> Amen. And I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock. Well, there's hints, hints. God's given some hints. This is how it's going to work. We know the rock is Christ. And I'm going to read one more verse, but we're going to develop this as the time goes on. Not today, but go, just go with me quickly to 1 Corinthians and chapter 10. I've got so many scriptures to show with you, but, but 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I know I'm probably jumping around because I've got a lot to say. But just because I want to pray for some of you, and God instruct me to do so, I want to give you something that you can hold on to. Don't you doubt for a moment. <clears throat> that you're not hidden in the cliff of the rock right now. <laughs> Amen. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses, into the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. You, you might as well shout amen right now. 
And that rock was what? It's the same rock that God sent him to and says, I want you to speak to it when the people complain. Because they were complaining. You brought us out here to die. We and our stock and all of our animals to die. And, and because they're thirsty, God says, I want you to get your rod. To just go ahead and, and speak. And, and first of all, he said, go strike the rock and it'll give you some water. How many know water comes out of the rock? How many know water comes out of Jesus? He said, you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. Huh? You drink of the water I will give you, you will never thirst again. He said, you go strike the rock, and the water came out and fed the people. Later on, the same thing happened. The people complained, they murmured against Moses, and God says, okay, God was tired of it. He says, okay, now take your rod and go now and speak to the rock. Because the people are complaining. I'm going to read all this in another time. And all of a sudden he went and Moses was so angry that he didn't do what God told him to do. And he smoked the rock two times. And when he did, water came out just like it did the first time. Think about it. Even though he disobeyed God, God would be revered in the eyes of the people because God said to Moses, because you didn't revere me, you will never enter the promised land. But then the next verse says, which we don't have time to read, but he, but he says, but God has been revered. How is that? Because the water came out anyway to feed the people. And that's the faithful God we serve. If you read the passage, which we would in another time, he said, and God was revered in the sight of the people. But he said to Moses, because you didn't revere me in the sight of the people, you will never enter in. The next verse says, and God was revered in the sight of the people. How was he revered? Because God gave them the water that they asked for, even though Moses disobeyed his instruction. You know why? Because God is faithful to his people. Because God is faithful to his people. So you might be thirsting right now. I don't know where your thirst is coming from. Is it physically? Is it emotional? Is it financial? Is a need. God is a fully aware of it. And he's going to be revered in your life. Because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But I'll be with you until the end of the age. So it doesn't matter what you're going through at the moment. The people were so upset with Moses, they wanted to stone him. Moses got scared and ran to God says, God, look, look, these people, your people, <laughs> they want to stone me because they're complaining. They don't have any water. And God says, I want you to do this one more time. But Moses disobeyed God, and he did the opposite of what God told him. But God still was faithful to give them drink of the rock. Because he's a faithful God. Stand up on your feet with me, please. I say, stand on your feet with me. Because he's a faithful God. Now, I, need to, I, need, I, I want you to keep that in mind, that he's faithful to his word. Because before they left Egypt, he says, I will care for my people, and I will bring them in. I'm bringing them out of bondage to bring them into promise. And no matter what they did, God always showed up for them. Even times that they disobeyed God, times that they made mistakes, times that they, they deliberately went against his will and his word, God still showed up. Many of them died because God says these ten times they have rebelled against me. But I'm going to keep my promise that I made to their father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob even though they disobeyed me. I'm going to keep my promise. And what's the promise of God? What's God's promise to you? That I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but I'll be with you until the end of the age. God's promise, he watches over, and he will keep his promises. 
He's not like us. He's not a man that he should lie. Or even the Son of God that he should, the Son of Man that he should repent. Right now, I'm hearing the Lord say, He wants to meet you at the point of your need. If you can only believe, if you can only trust Him right now, and say, Lord, no matter what I face, no matter what I'm going through, I know that prayer works. And you said we pray for one another that we might be healed. I need healing right now. Some of you, if you're in pain physically, I want you to come. If there's a need in your life that you've been waiting and believing and trusting God for, this is the time we'll touch and agree. And we're going to make sure that the yoke is destroyed in your life. Do yourself a favor, though. I want you to notify somebody that's saved already about what happened tonight. You say, well, I ain't got nobody I can call. You can call us. We don't know you, but we want to get to know you. Call us, write us. Let us know what happened. Let us pray for you. Let us give you a little instructions about the things that's probably going to happen in the near future. And let us tell you about this path and this journey that you're on. You made the most quality decision tonight that you will ever make in your life. And it's an eternal decision. We love you and we're here for you. And we're praying for you. God bless you. And we look forward to seeing you on Sunday morning. Thank you for joining us for the service today. We pray that the message was a blessing to your life. We also pray that you consider sowing a financial seed into the ministry to allow us to continue to spread this gospel. Thank you once again. Your seed may leave your hand, but it will never leave your life.